Good morning. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us for this month's Detect to Protect webinar. And my name is Kim Schofield. I'm from Stamus Networks, and I'll be moderating uh, today's webinar and then managing questions at the conclusion of our session. Uh, today's webinar is presented by Peter Manip. He's our co-founder and CSO for Stamus, as well as Phil Owens, who is our VP of Customer Solutions. Um, so the webinar should take 45 to 50 minutes. Um, and then at the conclusion of the presentation, we will pause to answer any questions that you have. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, we would just ask that you please use the Q&A function in Zoom that's located at the bottom of your screen. You can go ahead and type those questions in and then we'll take, it, take those at the end. Uh, and just a reminder today that our webinar is being recorded and we'll send a link to the video and audio recording as well as some other materials. Uh, we'll send all that information, email that out to you early next week. And so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn the session over to Peter. Thank you very much, Kim. Hello, folks, and welcome. Um, let me actually uh, go ahead and uh, try to introduce you, Stamps Networks, who we are, what we do, and why we make a difference. Uh, my name is Peter Manev, as Kim mentioned. I'm a co-founder and chief strategy officer with Stamps Networks. Um, and I think I have an interesting story for you to tell, um, and um, which will be follow up with a live demo uh, by my colleague, uh, Phil. Um, so first of all, um, we're a global team with global customer base. So we were founded in 2014, headquartered in both Indianapolis and Paris. Um, so um, it's really, really amazing to see that we have a, such a good diversity in terms of different geographical locations and cultures, uh, both, as I mentioned, in customer base and, and with our team. Um, so... Um, um, our team comes from both many places in um, Europe and um, North America, um, and our customer uh, base um, actually is uh, quite wide, um, everything from government, institutional, central banks and insurance providers to multinational um, um, organizations, um, um, uh, including military and uh, financial institutions. Um, and uh, we also have customers in uh, the travel and hospitality industry, market uh, leading cybersecurity vendors, uh, and managed uh, security service providers. So, um, why Stamps? You know, who we are? Well, first of all, the Stamps Network team has been evangelizing, improving, uh, and donating features and developing Suricata since 2009. We are actually the leader in Suricata-based network security. The network security in Suricata is our bread and butter. This is what we do. Um, this is our core expertise. Um, we've donated multiple um, um, cold additions and tools to the Suricata project with pride. Um, our co-founders of the companies are actually met in the Suricata project. I met with Eric there um, via the Suricata project. So very, very thankful for uh, that this project is there uh, because otherwise we would have not created Stamos. Um, our executive leaders are also uh, world leaders at uh, Emerging Threats that uh, is creating threat intel for Suricata. Um, so having that solid base, um, we actually uh, created the Stamos Security Platform, which is uh, actually the world's most advanced Suricata-based network detection and response solution. So um, it combines different uh, detection methods and algorithms to in order to um, improve its uh, both performance and detection accuracy. So that doesn't mean that it's just signatures it's or IOC matching or um, only machine learning. There is all these things and also algorithmic threat detection and combinations of those. So that um, will allow us to be more accurate and to actually be uh, more capable when it comes to detecting uh, uh, threat actors um, alongside with uh, with guided threat hunting, um, which uh, we will demo and talk about a little bit later too. While doing all that, we are actually in charge of protecting uh, of assets of total value of over 10 trillion um for uh, global financial institutions um so why again why suricata why stamos uh, we are de determined for the success of uh, both suricata and the network security um uh, monitoring itself 
with the clear vision idea to catch um, the most difficult uh, threat actors out there and um, um, to provide value. Uh, we, in, in view of that, we actually also um, try to feedback and participate to the community um, and Suricar community primarily, um, any um, and all useful uh, information uh, back, uh, including we authored the um, open source book, um, the Security Analyst Guide to Suricata. Uh, on our GitHub repo, we have over 25 different projects that uh, we've open sourced to the Suricata community um, that uh, hopefully uh, brings value and it's helpful. Those include things like uh, softwares like Selks, uh, which is a turnkey Suricata um, IDS NSM uh, solution ready to go dockerized with over thousands of downloads per month. Uh, also, some of the major things that we donate back are popular open source, open source tools like the Suricata language server, um, which actually allows you to, when you write signatures, to auto-complete and auto-test them, specifically for Suricata. Um, Splunk app, which actually is based on Suricata data visualizations ready to use, similar for Kibana and Elasticsearch. We, um, also have uh, open sourced a lateral movement rule set specifically developed for Suricata, Jupyter playbooks that are used for actually, um, even if you want to algorithm threat hunting Suricata, these things are actually based off even uh, feedback and lessons learned that we actually uh, gathered during um, some of the largest uh, NATO live fire cyber exercises that we've participated for. So, um, we incorporate that knowledge too, uh, as well. Um, we also have Septune and Gopher Cap. Uh, these are also uh, uh, popular, um, uh, two popular tools uh, for Suricata. So um, we try to give back um, as well and um, share our expertise. So combining the best of security point solutions, um, what does it mean actually? Well, intrusion detection, for example, um, everything's got good and bad sides, right? Everything's got pros and cons. So um, intrusion detection system, well, um, highly effective signatures. Um, he, he has very good performance. Um, some are extensible, but the downside, of course, is that there's a too many so-called fa false positives. So um, you actually look at a signature and you end up not understanding it, or you end up actually saying, okay, this should have actually is not what I expected. So it's more of a context rather than actually a, a true positive for positive variation. But a lot of, in a lot of cases, through detection system, that's what they're famous for, a lot of false positives. Um, so then we have network security monitoring. Again, everything pros and cons. So Good forensics, uh, open and extensible, offers a lot of evidence, right? Offers a lot of data. Uh, the problematic is like, what are you going to do with that, that data? You, know, you have to have a plan, you have to have a setup, you have to have external analytics engines, um, algorithm solutions. So you have to um, uh, plug in and do um, also a lot of work in there. So um, like even effective real-time detection. Um, next comes the NDR, network detection response. So um, it, it really brings up the game here, advanced anomaly detection, automated response. This is very important, very good event prioritization and so on. Uh, but in a lot of cases, it's um, not so extensible. Uh, in a lot of cases, there's SaaS solutions based on cloud customers or actually, um, organizations are having very difficult time sharing their data, both in terms of privacy and um, it's cost prohibitive as well to the to the cloud and um, and back um, and uh, limited evidence. So our differentiator, where we are different with the knowledge that and expertise that we have, is like we take basically all of the good things um, of these three uh, systems and we cr we create. We created a standard security platform, right? So it has, unlike any other NDR systems, um, it takes the very best features of all the three IDS, NSM, and NDR solutions while eliminating all the limitations for each. Um, so this is actually uh, our major uh, differentiator in there. Um, and that's very important uh, for us to keep differentiating and to keep evolving. 
um, and present the customers with actually viable, actionable results. Now, um, when it comes to deployment, uh, some security platform can be is very flexible in deployment. It can be deployed in multiple scenarios. So it could be in the cloud, it could be on premise, it could be an air gapped environment, um, in public, public, private offices and branch offices. Um, there are response ready integrations. Uh, available to different source sim solutions um edrs even open xdr and similar so that is very important to have flexibility at least what we've learned from from our customers and uh and what we the feedback that we've learned from our customers and um also what is really really important is while we provide the flexibility to um actually be um uh, really useful and empowering to um, the users that actually use the, the uh, solution. So in other words, uh, the experts needs data, detail, control, and honesty. So why is that? Well, detail is like, for example, um, complete network visibility, but what is the logic behind a particular event? Why was this event, for example, escalated to me? Um, um, a lot of... Um, uh, let's say other vendors have a possibility where a certain event is escalated, but the logic why was this escalated point is not visible to the end user. And that's actually important. So we have all these details. We give control, um, um, thus empowering the network security experts over um, the deployment as it could be adapted over the specific environment because there's no environment like any other. Um, and we provide guided threat hunting as well. All that allows for these um, experts and our users to uh, and for the tools to be proactive, to actually take charge and stop being so much on the defensive and go a little bit more um, aggressive and, and try to um, to be proactive about the whole uh, concept of finding bad guys. Um, and of course, honestly, so no exaggerated claims. Be clear of what you can and cannot do. Uh, because that also actually minimizes the risk um, and the logic behind any event, why is it generated, what led to it, and, and why is it there. Talking about the logic and, and why a specific event was um, generated or um, some detection was triggered actually brings an interesting point. Um, you have to have different and multiple, a lot of different detection mechanisms available. Why? Because it actually, the combination of those actually is what is really powerful when um, trying to catch uh, uh, unauthorized activity, policy violation, bad actors, um, advanced persistent threats, and all similar things. Um, so what we have is um, actually exactly that in our product. So again, as I mentioned, it's not just simply IDS alerts or IOC matchings. There's a bunch of um, other um, detections that go and make their progress through um, the final results in um, in in the um, in the solution. So, um, actually, analysts and security operators are empowered with um, alerts, uh, stateful detection. Um, you ha we have uh, different sorts of, for example, newly registered domains uh, citing something is new. I haven't seen that before in our network, uh, homoglyph detection, machine learning based detection on, uh, on based on flaws and encrypted connection in order to um, to, to lift uh, specific, uh, very suspicious uh, and actionable uh, events uh, be consulted. Um, organizational enrichment, this comes into a very, very important role because again, as I mentioned, there's no organization like uh, one like the other. The, there's no setup one like the other, and it always changes. Um, so organizational context and enrichment on the fly helps a long way. What works for me in this setup doesn't mean it's going to work uh, for you in your setup because your setup might be different, different specifics, different organization, different legal requirements, um, and so on. Um, automation and triaging, that needs to come up and deal with all the um, millions and billions of event, uh, events that we have. Anything from phishing, um, that also needs to be taken care of, attempts even. Um, and then we come to the actually high confidence declarations of compromise, 
stateful logic, uh, hosting sites, um, uh, which is basically asset identification and tracking. So what has happened on that, on that asset with the perspective of time, when and where, what was new, uh, when it happened, who was logged in, things like that. All that needs certain sort needs certain form of automation, and not only on our screens, but actually should be pluggable, extensible, and available to easily be integrated into any existing environment. That's where the REST API comes in, and we are fully 100% REST API um, are capable, so we very easily integrate into SOAR and all that. Um, again, these are lessons learned back from um, the trenches, so to speak, on jargon. Um, and um, now, let Peter, me walk let's walk you through. Yeah, go sorry, ahead. real quick. Just just want to chime in a little bit here. Something that sure. that we kind of miss sometimes, and and a lot of the Sericata, some of the folks here that are that are listening, uh, you know, might be Sericata fans or or even Sericata users. Um, what what a lot of them sometimes don't realize is how much NSM data is also produced by Sericata. So um, we kind of skipped over that little uh, box down at the bottom, but we there's about uh, 25, 30 or so protocols that are actually. Uh, that that actually um, um, get parsed out, and that metadata is available, and as you can see, goes into a data lake, and is also can be utilized to help um, in doing your investigations and things like that. That then one of the reasons Absolutely. why we had mentioned we could take IDS data, but we're not just alerts with some data, right, and flow records. We're we're also generating this NSM data, which is uh, which is very very uh, um, helpful when when doing investigations and and for evidence. Um, gathering totally totally absolutely thank you very much and i was actually was thinking of maybe giving a um, um a life scenario example here um so this is a case study um that um we were involved in one of many but uh we had a very simple project uh, approached by um a friendly uh set up uh, a production deployment uh, that the process and, and ask us can you tell us what's going on on this uh, let's say network uh, it was like a, a, a basically a hosting provider um, and they needed some information back so we had a very simple small if you will 10 gigabit a second length and we just plugged in um, our um, appliances uh, in the some security platform uh, there and uh, so in the course of a week, there were like 16 billion security events, 16 billion logs, if you will. Those were all sorts of logs. So that's one week, basically. 16 billion of them. That's a lot. So okay, what do you do with that? Where do you start from? You know, what do you what do you start looking for first? And things like that. That those are questions that we needed to answer. Um, and of course, uh, because they were actually uh Hosting provider, you know, a lot of things are going on there that are usually very noisy, you know, scans uh, all the time. They were, um, we actually were tracking, as on the slide here, over 37 million endpoints uh, by way of hosting sites. And, and we could do that, no problem. So, but the thing is like, okay, you have 16 billion events and 37 million endpoints. So what do you need? What, what needs your attention first? Because actually... You know, you have to start from somewhere and you need to start from the most important um, thing. So this is where IDS and NSM uh, comes in. You, you know, they produce a lot of data and OK, that's great. Um, and what's what do you do with that data? And this is a problem, actually, the, uh, that we solve um, specifically based with uh, with expertise in Suricata and actually um, what happened there was like all that was crunched to you have these 28 major threats or threat actors actually in the environment. Uh, there's 95 impacted assets inside that environment. There were different tunneling techniques used, um, eight of them, and there was numerous beacon detections. But um, we offered that uh, that process just by plugging the platform. We offered that process by actually, you know, going down the funnel and be like, here it is, you know, here's the actual result. This is what you need to know. This is what's going on in your network. Uh, now you have all the evidence and all the other data it's there of course but in a lot of cases you just need to answer the question is there something that needs my attention now what it is and 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 where's and where's all the data um and that's and that's where we come in but um probably you hear that from um, uh, other vendors and uh, that brings the question why 
Um, so, for example, why Stamos? Um, why the Stamos security platform? Well, first of all, um, great visibility into threats into greater in, in visibility into threats and activity. So, in other words, um, um, allows for multiple detection technologies, guided threat hunting to uncover the weak, the weakest attack signals. Um, we also have. Um, we are very um, agnostic. We're Suricata native, so we can have our probes or your Suricata sensors. We can work um, with both. Um, we are open and extensible. So in other words, as I mentioned, it, it's very easy for us to integrate into an existing environment um, and empower and improve it and offer useful uh, detection and, and a change of actually in the visibility. Um, we also are transparent with the detections and the evidence. Here's the evidence, here's the detection. This is why it was escalated to you. A lot of vendors are not. Um, but again, we hold expertise, we're transparent, and we like to be actually useful. Um, then, you know, of course, we work in both in uh, cloud and uh, on prem, also in air gapped environments, as I mentioned. But um, you know, with uh, we we build with mind that we need to be able to fix any uh, fit into any existing uh, organizational need and deployment. So, uh, privacy protecting and secure deployment options are uh, well built into our architecture. Yeah, um, the, and I'd like I'd like yeah, to interrupt right there real quick because one of the, one of the reasons okay. one of the reasons for this bullet is also the fact that that all of our analytics happen on our platform. Right, we're not going to mm -hmm. ship your data to the cloud in order to do our analytics. Yeah, very good. Um, so, yeah. so every everything that that you see here is all being done. All the analytics, everything that's happening, is all happening within the platform. So that means if you're deploying on premise, all the all your stuff stays on premise. If you're deploying in the cloud, all your stuff's going to stay in your VPC in the cloud. It's not going to go someplace else to us. Um, or anything like that. So um, that's one of the reasons that we're protecting and securing those deployment, um, de your deployment options, right? So um, all analytics happens within the platform itself. Totally, totally. Um, actually, I see that more often than, than the other way around, to be very honest, um, for sure. Um, and one of the few things that you can do only with the system security platform is actually this transi transition from native Suricata deployment to um uh two capabilities in SSP. So um we actually can work with both with regular Suricata sensors that you already have deployed. And we have of course our own Stamos Networks probes which offer um uh, advanced functionality. Um all that we've been um I've been uh, mentioning before and we've been uh, talking with Phil about before on this webinar. Um, anything from um, alert and data enrichment organizational context automated triaging um, and um, high fidelity declarations of compromise. So this is where we actually uh, hold the expertise and bring up and say, this is the thing that needs your attention now. Um, and all that, of course, can be customized and adapted for your environment, because I said, security policies are different depending on organizations and similar. And um, 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 alongside with that, guided threat hunting, log analytics, full pa packet capture, file extraction, and all those similar. So all the evidence is there, all the detection logic is there, all the customization capabilities are there, and we're there to help you out as well. But I've been talking for a while, so how about, um, Phil, I have a proposal for you. If you uh, do like a live demo and I sit around and watch it, if that's all. And you, right sit, you sit and watch? You sit and watch? Yeah, you that's, and that's watch, perfectly yeah. fine. Yeah, let's, that's perfectly let's fine. That. We'll do that. Uh, <laughs> let's, let's bring up that last slide. I, I want to real quickly just kind of lead you into the demo. I'm going to do a live demo. Uh, no, stay, stay, go back to the, yeah, this I'm going to do a live. Yeah, yeah perfect. Um, we're going to try to cover uh, three use cases if, if, if I can. It's uh, threat detection and investigation. We're going to talk about. Uh, about how to go from a pants on fire event, as I like to call them, or a declaration of compromise, uh, right into an investigation of that to figure out what's going on. Uh, then we'll show you a little bit about the guided threat hunting that Peter has mentioned a couple of times, and then right, and then from there, a real quick look at some of the the network hygiene, which also is part of that guided threat hunting, as well as some other data that we have available um, from from a um, enrichment perspective that we're doing on the data that we're receiving. So um, as you know. Um, we're very heavy in, in with Sericata, um, and uh, 
And we can do a lot of these things and then do enrichment on top of the data that's actually being provided to us. So um, if you stop sharing, I will start and we will yes, do sir. the demo. I have stopped and you're on, sir. All right. So hit the little share button and you let me know when you can see my screen. I see a screen. Beautiful, beautiful. All right. So when you initially log into the Stamus Security Platform, where you head is this thing called the Operational Center. Uh, the key indicators across the top, uh, pretty self-explanatory. The analyzed traffic, as as you, as was shown, um, you have may have multiple probes. This aggregates all the data from all the probes into a single location. So you can see things like analyzed traffic. Uh, the number of events, we talked about that NSM information, so HTTP events, TLS events, flow records, all of those things that uh, make up the um, that NSM data all kind of flow into that. And in this demo environment that I have here, I had three gigs of data, I have 3.5 million events, right? And a lot of people say, well, 3.5 million, there's got to be false positives there. I'm going to tell you, um, you know, from a, from a detection event perspective or that one called alerts where there's 2,100 I'm going to tell you those things happened, right? Those events took place on the network. Whether whether or not they're interesting to you is a is is a different uh, type of story. But then we get into those last three categories there, where we have declarations, impacted assets, and active threats. So this is where we've actually taken all that data and um, we've we've aggregated what we can and correlated and brought it down to hey, I have two impacted assets with six active threats which make up seven declarations of compromise. Now, uh, a quick definition of a declaration of compromise is a threat on an asset. Uh, so one of the reasons why I show six active threats, but seven declarations is as you can see here, TrickBot happens to be on two. So a threat on an asset. And then a quick definition of an asset is an asset can be an IP address, it can be a username, it could be an email address. I will tell you that probably 95% of the time they're gonna show up as IP addresses as they do here, um, but I see the two impacted assets. So um, the other part of it in the middle, you'll notice we plot those assets on the cybersecurity kill chain. Now we let an attack take place here. So everything is in actions on objectives. Um, hopefully you're finding things before you hit actions on objectives and I'll show you uh, show you how that, that kind of happens as well. But I, but I do wanna mention that uh, in this demo environment, when you come in here, a junior analyst for instance could come in here and say, hey, what do I need to look at today? What is it that, that, that's on my plate? Now, hopefully this is empty. However, if it were empty, uh, this would be a boring demo. So um, we, we have some data here for you. So if you are looking at this from a junior analyst perspective, we can actually um, click on one of these threats that have taken place and we will give more detail around it. And all of the threats that we, um, we have within our coverage area have detailed descriptions about the threat as well as third-party links to places to find out more. So this is a great way to empower the analyst to learn uh, what it is that's going on in their environment. You'll also notice that we have a kill chain phase here. The kill chain phase is delivery. So Maldoc um, in delivery, you might want to catch it there. So hopefully you did. So this is what I was mentioning before, as opposed to letting the entire thing run, run for you so that we could actually have some data to show. Um, another way to actually look at the operational center information is under impacted assets. So remember, we had two assets and we had um, um, seven declarations of compromise, right, with six threats and trick bots on both of them. You'll also notice that if I hover, um, things are happening within, uh, I get the description right, right from this location as well. Um, this screen is an awesome place to go to be able to see um, what, what assets is what assets are impacted and with what. Um, but you'll also notice in the columns here, um, things like roles where we'll passively identify um, what role an asset may play within the organization. Uh, we have a handful of these uh, currently and we're adding some as we move along, but we have DHCP server and domain controller we can see here. And if you notice the host name underneath there um, that, that we're giving you as a view is probably a DC, right? Or a domain controller. Uh, we also allow for business context. So the network info that you see here, as um, Peter was pointing out, every organization is different and how they organize their network is different. So we allow you to actually um, name the network segments um, on your network or name the assets on your network. 
Uh, in this case, it's mainly the uh, se segments. And I can see that um, from a network information perspective, I have uh, things in my zero trust servers far server farm, as well as um, a user coming in through um, my VPNs, uh, and they're in the accounting uh, department, right? Uh, you'll also notice that uh, we have a user information uh, on the screen as well. Uh, this user information is got is gathered off the network or off the wire. So we aren't deploying agents to endpoints. Uh, we, we're not doing that. This is captured off the wire, uh, utilizing SMB protocol or utilizing Kerberos. So we're actually capturing that data. Uh, we also mentioned that, you know, all of this data is, um, is transparent, right? So if we are using a rule, a Sericata rule, for instance, to determine if something is bad, we will actually show you the rules so you can break it down and figure out uh, what, what's going on. But we also have, as you can see here, a bunch of relevant uh, metadata associated uh, with, with the event. So this is the Ursniff, uh, the actual Ursniff uh, threat. And we can also mention uh, MITRE techniques and tactics and give the analysts the ability to click here and find out what does this mean? What is this develop capabilities and what is the resources? So if you click there, take you to the MITRE page to actually uh, let you learn. So again, trying to um, give as much learning opportunities to possibly a junior analyst or or maybe even a seasoned analyst that, uh, but the MITRE technique is unfamiliar to them. So um, definitely a, a way to go from that perspective. Now, we also mentioned that we've narrowed down a bunch of events. So there could be hundreds, even thousands of events associated with each of these, right? And you can see some of them here, and I got three pages of this, but we've aggregated that together to give you the actual threats that are, are impacting this asset. So, so that you're not having to go through every single um, event, although they are here and available for you if, if you would like to see them. Another um, view that we have is what we call our timeline view, which is a, a Gantt chart, if you will, uh, of the actual attack that took place. So in this case, um, I can actually walk back and realize what um, what is my patient zero? What started all of this? So I can see from a timeline perspective that it was the threat Maldoc that kicked everything off. So um, I would have seen that first. I would have looked at it. Um, as, as an analyst, that's what I've uh, look, um, really started to uh, pay attention to before I actually got into the threats on objectives. But I can also uh, drill in a little deeper and see the kill chain threats. So here's a, a really good view of some of the anomaly capabilities that we have, things that have never, never been seen before on the network. And as, as you notice, right before Maldoc kicks in, we had a new user that was seen, which was the one that um, was mentioned earlier, but it actually turns out that that was a new user never seen on the network before. Um, and as I scroll down through here, I can see every step of the way as it moves through the cybersecurity kill chain and what, uh, what was impacting and what offenders, so what uh, external IP addresses were involved or what it was offending. Uh, in this case, Eternal Blue targeted something internally. So what I'm seeing is that lateral movement taking place between these two boxes, utilizing Eternal Blue. All right, so um, that gives us a really, good, um, a really good view and a lot of great information on, on what to look at uh, as, we, as we do our investigation. Uh, so I can move into the dashboard and hunting area and maybe take a look at TrickBot, for instance. So all of these, everything that you see here on the dashboard is uh, drillable, so I can move into with the little uh, hourglasses and things like that. So if I uh, look at TrickBot, uh, so this is on both my boxes, and I know that because as I scroll down here, my targets are both of these assets that, uh, that were impacted in the declarations of compromise uh, with TrickBot. And as I, can, as I mentioned, I can drill into any of these. So in this case, I can actually um, drill into this alert, which shows it was requesting a network DLL. From here, I can actually um, make, make a drill even further or deeper into the information that's happening. So I've gone from 2,100 alerts with just two clicks down to four um, that I really want to take a look at. And if I click on the alerts section, it will show me those four uh, alerts that took place. 
And I can pick any of these alerts. And when I do that, um, I'm able to see related events. So I get um, signature information. So um, synthetic view, so metadata information that's associated with and aggregated with all of the alert information as well. Uh, and I can see that here. Um, and I'm also able to see related information. So as some of you may know, Sericati uses a unique identifier called a flow ID on all of its records. And if that flow ID um, is, is um, um, seen for multiple alerts, uh, we will show you all the alerts that fired that are associated with this particular alert. So I have um, a bunch of other IDS type of events that are taking place. I also have file info um, available to me, uh, as well as uh, the related flow, so all the flow data, all the HTTP data, but some of the key pieces of information that we're also picking up is we actually have the file that's associated. So right here, I can see it's actually a PNG, but it says that it's a DLL. Uh, I can uh, download it right from here. I can also download the PCAP of this alert. So basically the flow that took place, I can download that PCAP, uh, clicking the download button, it will extract it. All of this stuff is located on the probe and it will move through um, and actually uh, allow me to download the PCAP for further investigation or for storage for evidentiary purposes for a later date. Um, from that files perspective, we utilize a SHA-256 uh, hash on all of the files. And this, th what this does is it helps us deduplicate the files as we save them. So we're not saving for every one of these, they could be the same file. We'll actually save only one copy of that file uh, based off of its hash. Now you can also take this hash and as I've done up here, I can move into virus total and take a look at it. So this is that same hash. I, I just did it beforehand for you. Uh, and you'll notice that it's very red. And uh, so we can take that in and take a quick look and see what's going on. Uh, as Peter said to us earlier, it's so red that we need a black and white TV to view it because it's so bright and red. So. But in any case, uh, there we have um, uh, some of the detailed information that's available to us um, uh, within, the, within the dashboard. So this is an investigation of TrickBot all the way down into evidentiary information, uh, including full flow records and everything. Now, something that was mentioned in passing during uh, Peter's part of the presentation was the fact that everything that I've shown you here so far can be done via a REST API so we can integrate, right? All of the data that you see here um, is all being, being delivered via JSON uh, into our environment, which means it can also be delivered into a third-party SIM or data lake for future for, for other types of analytics or maybe with correlation for an EDR tool and things like that. Um, what, what I failed to mention at the very beginning is that our declarations of compromise that we initially started to look at, all of those can also generate webhooks to kick off events within a SOAR like Palos XSOAR, um, which we're, we're finishing up the integration right there for that. Uh, we also have um, uh, the ability to send into a Slack channel or um, an IR tool like the Hive or a ticketing system like ServiceNow. All of those um, are capable. You can actually send a webhook and deliver that information. Uh, we're, we've also integrated in with, um, with an EDR vendor where you can actually quarantine a, a device based off of a declaration of compromise uh, that comes in on that device. So that's uh, just some, some details around some of the things that can be done uh, with the tool. And again, all the data is available via a REST API as well as via syslog into a... Uh, into a data lake or SIM. So that was the investigation part of this. Um, the next thing that I wanna do is if I go back into the dashboard, um, you'll notice I've created a filter here. And if this filter is really interesting to me, I can actually escalate this and create my own declarations of compromise. And this is really great if a senior analyst decides they just wanna see the data, come in here, start doing you know the, the bad word hunting, right? Which we all know needs to be done, but, but uh, but sometimes uh, it might seem a little overwhelming, but somebody can come in here, do some hunting, create this filter and escalate it to a declaration of compromise so that a junior analyst can start taking a look. Does this happen again? If it does, what's the impact? How, what do I need to do? So that can all, 
all be done by creating a declaration of compromise. Another thing that was mentioned was guided threat hunting. Um, and we have a lot of filter sets that we've, uh, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to save. I meant to load. So lots of filter sets that we've already predefined for you or guided your threat hunt. So for instance, um, one of the things that I like to, uh, to take a look at is uh, in this demo environment, because I know it's here uh, and can show you is the fact that we have some obfuscated executables um, that, are, that are running around as images, right? So if I scroll down, uh, lots of different pieces of metadata is available to the, uh, to the analyst to be able to drill in um, for this. And we can see these PNG files from a URL perspective. Um, but if I take this a uh, step further and, and like I mentioned before, go into the alerts, I can actually download that. But I can see as I'm looking at it that it is in fact actually an executable, even though the content type says it's an image PNG file and the URL says it's a PNG. Um, so that's that's here. And again, I have the file, I have the PCAP, so I can put the file, um, I can use the SHA-256 hash here, or I can actually um, um, have this file put into a sandbox for, 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 for analysis or some other um, tool to do um, dynamic or static analysis on the file itself. And then finally, what I wanna quickly dive into is I mentioned these filter sets and we have lots of them. Um, like I said, about 122 of them to, uh, to look at, but uh, a bunch of them could be policy violations. So from a, from, it would help if I could spell, right? Uh, policy violations uh, that, that might uh, be happening, clear text passwords, things like that, that we've already predefined for you uh, from a filter perspective. So you can just start doing, um, doing your investigation right from that uh, predefined filter and then drilling in from there. Uh, another thing that I want to point out from an enrichment perspective and, and a data hygiene is if I scroll down, as I mentioned before, lots of data here um, to start an investigation so you can pick and choose where you want to be. Um, if I get down to the TLS information, we're actually pulling cipher suites from the data. So we're enriching all of our information with, uh, with the actual TLS cipher suites as well as the cipher security where we're cross-referencing with, uh, with ANSI uh, to figure out what might be degraded, recommended, or actually insecure. Now in this demo environment, uh, as you might imagine, um, we have a lot that are insecure, but all I have to do is click that and now I can see, okay, what are my insecure cipher suites on my network and who is using them? So as I scroll up, I can see um, the 10.7.5.101. I can actually see it from a target perspective easier. Uh, these two machines uh, in my network are utilizing cipher suites that are insecure. Let me go. Let me go investigate that and take it a little a little further. So with that, what I'd like to do is um, is send this back over to um, to Peter. I think he's got like one or two follow on slides, and then we'll get into the Q and A. Right. Yeah, sure. But Can before I... that, Phil, okay. if you don't mind, I actually had a question. If you if you don't, I mind will bring answering. it right back up. <laughs> yeah, um, I was just curious um, if you could elaborate a little bit or um, show us, like, for example, an impact that to show a user Mario Zaragoza. Uh, I was wondering if you could actually sh um, give a bit more insights about that uh, about that um, host. Uh, in user on it and, and things like that. So uh, for example, you were on the operation screen. Oh, um, so what, what I didn't do from a, from a host perspective. So if I go into that impacted asset and we actually take a look at that machine, right here, we have what we call our host insights. And this is a great piece of, of information uh, to dive into its real time um, and a snapshot of time, including the timeline that we looked at before. So I'm looking at over the last 24 hours, what the impact was. So this machine has that user associated with it. I got the host name. I have the application layer. So these are all of the, um, all of the protocols that we saw going out of that machine, what applications are being used on that machine. Um, so we got some TLS, we got HTTP. We also see the HTTP agents, um, TLS agents, uh, that, that are with it. We can also see the top 30 signatures and sightings. So things that have never been seen before that I've mentioned over here uh, in the timeline, new, new user scene. Um, I can see that in the sightings here. 
and if there were any beacons on this asset uh, that had this user in particular on it. And as you can see, I can drill into the user and find out more information of maybe where that user is logged in in other places uh, by drilling in and moving, uh, moving across the dashboard. Um, or even some beaconing information that has taken place uh, within the within this box and what uh, that information looks like. I can drill in and, and really see some details. Does I that answer your that, question? I, yeah, no, I like that screen a lot because usually when you're investigating an incident or, uh, or uh, let's say, threat hunting or you're looking for some violation of similar things, that's the screen. That, that screen sums up a lot of information in here. This yeah, is probably all in one gigabytes place. on terabytes of data over time and things like that. It just crunches it out in here and it's done over time. So we don't go like pull uh, 6 billion events at the same time to generate that screen. No, this is actually condensed deduplicate information. And it gives me all that I want to know. For example, where was that user seen? Also on what other hosts? What's on that host in terms of not just um, signatures, but you know what's what in terms of as you mentioned, sightings, beacons, you know a timeline. What's new on that house that I haven't seen on any other house and things like it. Just gives me all that condensed information that is is great for an investigation. You know, well, with a look, you can actually um, uh, uh, have it, and um, yeah. it's it's actually empowering. Again, um, and to go back to that point, it's actually <laughs> it's empowering because otherwise it saves me a lot of money power and a lot of man hours to actually come and generate that. And again, this is readily available via REST API, all condensed view. Um, and it's actually, we have customers using it actively for incident response via um, source solutions and similar things. Yeah, sorry for the deviation. I just wanted to no, uh, no, show you're, one of my favorite absolutely things. <laughs> it is. It is one of the favorite things. And I totally, uh, I didn't I didn't bring it up. So thank you for uh, for reminding me. But in, the, in, in all fairness, we could stay here for a while, huh? so yeah, we, absolutely. We can go in for a Talk few more because there's a lot of absolutely. other cool things and 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 more um, uh, interesting stuff, of course, to be to be shown around, and we could be a while, but we don't could do so much in the time. So, thank you very much. Sorry yeah. to the interruption. <laughs> no problem. Wait, no actually, problem. Phil, do you want to stay just maybe on the demo uh, slides just for a few minutes? I did have a couple of questions coming sure. as you were going sure, through sure. that, and I thought it might make sense to cover those now, and then and then we All can right. do a final. A run on questions after Peter finishes the last few slides. Sure, sure, sure. Um, so going back to what you were just talking about, I had a question. Uh, someone said they have an enterprise with more than 12,000 hosts. So how many hosts can our system track with all that data, you know, that you were showing on the host screen? So all of this data on the host screen, th this is what we meant when the slide came up that uh, Peter was talking about. We had 37 million uh, mm -hmm. uh, assets assets or hosts that were being monitored and maintained where we would be able to bring up this data uh, associated with those hosts. Um, so that was in that in that live fire um, data center that we were deployed in. Uh, we had over over 37 million. Um, yeah, and I can, uh, I, can, I can add in because I was actually investigating. I was part of the, the team that investigated, uh, that was asked to do the investigation there. So in, in that specific case, uh, we, we were tracking just like this host in here, just like what you see on the screen with all the data around it. We were tracking over 37 million, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And that was not at the expense of petabytes of data. This all the all the storage that we needed to track these hosts over time. Um, I don't remember the exact number, but it was anywhere between something like 50 and 100 gigabytes uh, of space. That's it. Yeah, because... So we actually, again, as I mentioned, we don't need all those billions of events to pull and to, to show that we track it actually and um, generate it over time. Great. All right, thank you. Um, so two other ones I think that would be good. Do you have any mechanisms to compress uh, the data that I send to Splunk? I'm gonna, Peter, do you have a, an answer to that? I mean, the data that we send um, is, uh, is JSON data. It's coming through the what we didn't mention is since you're utilizing Splunk uh, for those for those folks that are, um, we do have the Splunk forwarder that's built into yeah. our probes. Um, so it's all going native into Splunk from a Splunk forwarder. So um, does that do compression, Peter? Uh, that that's a question I don't uh, I don't know. I'm not of my sure head. on that technical side to be very honest. But uh, <clears throat> so we have a, a couple of ways to send the data: Splunk forwarder and which is the Splunk native way. 
and uh, via regular like um, syslog or JSON shipping and similar things. So whatever compression is available to those tools, we can actually definitely use it. But if yeah. that answers your question, I'm not sure. I, I will tell you that um, all the data, if um, now this, not Splunk, but all the data that we store, we store in, as you can see over on the left-hand side, we store in an Elk um, uh, data lake, and that is um, compressed inside of uh, Elastic, for yeah. instance. Yeah. So. Okay, good. Um, so the next one is, does your system do full-time packet capture? And if not, what triggers the PCAP that you were showing? So uh, the PCAP that I was showing is triggered actually by the alert. And what we're doing is we're actually capturing the flow uh, that generated that alert. So we call it conditional PCAP capture, right? So it's not full time. So you don't need petabytes of information to be able to, to maintain, say, 10 or 15 days worth of data. Uh, we actually uh, dedupe and and keep just the PCAPs that are associated with the alerts that are firing. And that includes those declarations of compromises that we that we talked about so that those PCAPs would be available uh, for evidentiary purposes uh, to pull down. So it's not, it's not full time. Uh, it is generated based off of the flow that generated the alert that took place. So the session where that alert took place and deduplicated. Also to keep in mind, it's distributed. Uh, what I mean by that is that those PCAPs um, are stored on the probes themselves uh, and only retrieved when requested. So either requested in the UI or via an, a REST API poll uh, to get the data. So, um, so it is distributed across, it's not a central location. Um, where you have to have a whole bunch of, like I said, petabytes of potential information. And we do keep, uh, because we dedupe and, and all of that, we are keeping uh, the size of those PCAPs uh, to a minimum. Okay, uh, thank you. There was a follow-up to that Splunk question, and it was, how do I reduce the amount of data that I'm sending to Splunk? Oh, so that that I can absolutely uh, um, touch on. We have lots of different ways we can uh, we can do that. Uh, one of the One of the main portions there is the ability to choose, um, do I just send alerts or am I going to send all that MS NSM data? Uh, and I can pick and choose which protocols I want to be sent to there. I can also filter. So, um, and what I mean by that is I can do filtering based off of, um, uh, I will actually pull up an appliance and we can take a look. We'll dive deep into some of this. I need to move something out of my way. Sorry about that. Well, this is called a deep dive after all. So we will dive deep. Uh, you'll notice here I have filters where I can actually filter uh, DNS events or flow records and all of that. Any of the filters that are happening happen to Splunk as well, uh, as, as well as you can choose. I mentioned we have like 25, 30 protocols that we can pick and choose from to actually parse. Uh, but I can also tell Splunk to only, only take I want to send the logs to Splunk. You can see my information there. Uh, I can even send only the alerts if I want to. So uh, I can really, you know, filter down pretty good what it is I'm going to be sending to Splunk itself. Right. Actually, to be honest, we we have customers that are actually actively doing this because it's a lot of data to be sent yeah. to Splunk and it could be cost prohibitive. They actually do that filtering to send specific things to Splunk only. Um, and keep the rest of the data in, in the Stum Central uh, server. And, and yes. as you can see, we have a Splunk tab in here. That's because we do have, like I mentioned before, a Splunk forwarder deployed on our on our actual uh, probes. So hopefully that right, uh, answers it for you. Excellent. Um, yeah, thank I do you. See, I do see one other um, question in here that's kind of interesting to me, and I want to show it because I, I'm really proud of the fact that we don't hide data. Uh, the other question that I see in here is you talk about the best of NSM. Can I assume mm -hmm. that 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 is a reference to Brozeek? Um, and if I were to <clears throat> deploy the Samus platform, do I still need it? And the answer to that question is no, we don't think you do. And I showed you all the protocols. But again, I can actually dive into Kibana. I, we give you access to all of this NSM data. Um, so even if alerts are not firing and, and all of that, I can actually dive into the, the elastic of, of course, this is live. So I'm going to start feeling like, uh, like, so, so we can actually see, uh, for instance, all the flow stats or just all the data that, that could be available, uh, within the, um, within here. So I can see the alerts, um, 
all the different protocols that we were talking about, flow records that are happening, probably a better dashboard would be, uh, we have over 50 dashboards that, uh, that we've pre-built for you that include things like, I want to see all the DMP3 traffic. I want to see all my TLS traffic. Um, I want to see all my HTTP traffic. Um, just show me a uh, good one is... Uh, network overview, for instance, which will break down, um, I believe, all the different protocols, app protocols that we've seen uh, in the network. And I can drill into that and see all the metadata that's associated with each of those that are being, that are actually being parsed. So um, yeah, we don't believe that you, you need a second solution, right? That we can actually provide all that data for you. So, and... Uh, Thanks, I'm so just really proud of the that. fact that we have all this data and it's available to you. So, yeah. That's all awesome. right. I'm going to stop sharing now so that uh, we can finish. <laughs> yeah, up we with, have. A, so um, I know we have a couple of other questions. I'm going to let Peter finish up with his slides and then we'll we'll take the rest of these questions that are here. And anyone else who has anything else, please feel free to, to type a question in. Yep, sure. So please, thank you, Phil, for the demo. And thank you, Kim. Um, Phil, let me know if you see my screen. Yes. Yes, oh, I see. Cool. Excellent. Um, so anyway, a quick summary. We have all the data, we generate all the data, we enrich all the data, we do automation around it. Um, and we also make the detection logic um, actually transparent. Um, and we actually do solve actual real problems. So for example, we have solved the IDS canon issue. We have solved, I have too many NSM data, which one do I start looking at first? Um, we have solved things like, give me the ultimate evidence, you know, that file extracted or that pickup, it's, it's all there. It doesn't mean that the job is done. No, we continue, we need to continuously evolve as the uh, malware threat actors and tactics evolve. So that's no problem. Uh, we just need to keep at it, uh, never give up. And um, with that in mind, um, again, um, all that while being um, open and extensible. So easy to integrate into an existing environment, easy to be able to allow for actually more advanced um, uh, operators to, to transfer knowledge uh, to, to their um, less experienced colleagues and things like that, because that's also very important um, in, in the IT security industry. Um, with that in mind though, I just wanted to, um, to highlight a um, quote from uh, um, one of our um, actually um, colleagues, friends and customer um, um, used, um, and we regularly have conversations with Hughes, uh, um, and um, including actually participating with his team, uh, joining uh, uh, NATO Life uh, Cyber Exercises and similar. Um, so, um, as you can see on your screen, we built our management service network detection on Stamos security platform because we can depend on it for highly accurate detection and to gather the evidence needed for a detailed incident investigation. Stamos security platform is easy to set up, use and integrate. It provides actionable insights into what's going on in the network, completing the visibility picture. Um, and I'm really proud of that quote because actually I know Yust and he is also um, a person that um, is hands-on. And, and so, it, so it means a lot to be able to, uh, to, to hear that from uh, him and ultimately his team. So much appreciated. Without further ado, I'm not going to expand more on it because as I mentioned earlier with Phil, we can stay for a few more hours, not even, if not even days, to, to showcase uh, use cases and features and similar. I'm going to open it up for other and extra um, uh, questions, please, if you don't mind. Yeah, I have a few extra. Um, so okay. you mentioned the ease of integration, and I actually did have a question about EDR integration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think I think I mentioned that the uh, during my pre my part of the presentation, uh, we do have an integration with um, some EDRs where we utilize things like webhooks to be able to quarantine or or do um, um, host IPS right H um, uh, HIPS, uh, where the where we can actually modify the um, the firewall on the machine to uh, block access to certain things based off of um, based off of the declarations of compromise firing and a webhook generating. So that's one type of integration. The other integration could be a little bit more nuanced in that all of our data can be delivered into a into a third party SIM. 
uh, all the EDR data can be delivered into a third-party SIM. And we are asset-based, as I mentioned before, which allows for easy correlation between the data from the EDR and the data from the network to be put together so that you can actually get a fuller picture of what's going on uh, in the environment. So I think that, that that really helps a lot too. All right, good. Um, so I have another question about um, how does Stamus compare with other vendors in the market? Uh, you know, someone like Dark Trace or Extra Hop. Go ahead, Peter. I know you always you, you you're very <laughs> passionate about that, so I'll, I'll let you get that yeah. one. Well, first of all, um, I'm not really sure if you can give a complete list of vendors because there's a lot. Uh, but our differentiators are simple. Again, we're transparent. We're easy to integrate. We share our data. Um, you know, whatever data we generate, we can put it in in your uh, lake or similar things. We hold actually an, ex an expertise and we've actually fixed um, the problem of ideas and alert cannons and we're further on building on top of that. Um, there is, um, and that's that's actually that's actually um, a major one. We offer customization. A lot of vendors don't. Uh, it's just their screen and no other screen. We're agnostic. Um, and that's, that's feedback from actually um, um, that comes in from customers, uh, from, from um, our customers and, and why they're choosing us. So um, it's actually as simple as that, as simple as it may sound. It's not that simple to do, but it's as simple as that. Um, you know, uh, be honest and transparent um, and provide useful, um, uh, useful detection. So actually um, the end user, the customer can use it and integrate it as opposed to just have this box sitting there that, that uh, it cannot be either integrated or cannot pull data out of it, or we cannot see what was the logic behind it that something was elevated to escalate it for, for a review, for example. So there's things like that. I can go on for a couple more hours. Is that okay? No. <laughs> sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so right. we're, we're I, I want to add to that. Yeah, oh, I, I want to add to that just just real quickly. Um, yep. You know, he, he talks about transparency um, and visibility, right, with regards to the data. And that's one of the things that I was trying to point out from a Kibana perspective, from when I was showing the, the we show you the actual rules, if there is a rule firing, if there is a beacon happening, we're going to show you the details around that and why it's happening. Uh, where a lot of our competitors that are really relying on, uh, in a bunch of cases, machine learning or or artificial intelligence, they can't actually show you uh, some of that data because some some of that data is being generated um, by by that uh, by that package, and and it's it's just much harder as an investigator to be able to dive in uh, and and see those types of things. So, right. I just want yeah. No, that, that's a good ad. Thanks. So we just have two more questions, and I think we can get through them fairly quickly. Um, if folks, sure. we're, we're not losing anyone yet, so we'll keep you on for a couple more let's minutes. Yeah. yeah, let's. Um, so one is in, on the install on the product. Do you need a pre-installed operating system underneath it? And also, can it be installed in the cloud? So the answer is yes to the last product uh, pro thing. Yes, it can be installed in the cloud, in the cloud and no. Um, we actually deploy appliances, whether those are virtual appliances, physical appliances, or cloud appliances. We take care of, of the operating system as well as the software that's running on the operating system, which means we do all the updating. Everything, everything is happening by updating. What I mean is we, we will deliver updates to you that updates both the operating system as well, so, uh, as well as the software. So it is an appliance that we are actually delivering to you. Um, so... So hopefully that takes care of that. No underlying OS. You don't have to go out and get, uh, you know, Red Hat or Debian or or Windows and run it. We actually um, take care of all that as the appliance. And we also take care of all the patching, security updates. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it's all it's all in there. Mm -hmm. But also the, the customer have access has access to the device, right? So you can actually log in and have a look as well. So. Yeah. Okay. Right, okay. Um, so what about if you restart the system? Do you lose the data that has been transferred transferred during the startup time frame? Uh, so no. And so there's two parts of the system. There's the central server, which has the user interface and the Elk stack and all of those pieces. And then there's the probe. Um, the only time that there might be some data loss is if you restart the probe, the probe's not going to be running. Therefore, it's not going to be collecting data. However, the probe does cache its data. So if you restart the central server, um, that data is cached and held on the probe until the uh, until the central server is back up and running, and then it will actually deliver 
Um, now that it goes without saying that if you're going to bring your central server down for three weeks, um, the probe's going to you know need to dump some of its its information. But uh, with with that in, with that said, typically for a normal reboot or 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 short outage or something like that, the probe caches its information before before it's sent to the probe or okay, sent great. to the central server. Sorry. Yep. Yep. Excellent. Uh, all right. So last question. This is a good one. How do you structure your pricing and licensing? So uh, we try to be very simple with that, and we structure our licensing um, based off of our probe appliances and the size of our probe appliances, which is sized based off of uh, the actual um, the actual line rate um, on the network. So we do sell the probes basically in um, in one in 100 meg, one gig, 10 gig, 40 gig increments, with a 100 gig increment coming out. Um, uh, here in the near future. And all of those um, are priced at a set price point based off of uh, what you saw. We were showing you the entire package. So it would be a single price per connection, per probe uh, for that uh, for for that line rate. So that's how the pricing is done. All right, thanks. So one more clarifying question on the pricing. Um, ask, a gentleman's asking about the size, yeah. do we size the licenses based on bandwidth? So I, I will say that uh, we, we will have our sales guys get to you so that you can talk a little bit more in detail with it. Um, how I just mentioned it is it's sized based off line rate, not bandwidth, meaning that if it's um, if you have a one gig line, uh, but you're using, say, 600 megabits, um, it's going to be a one gigabit probe. Now, our pricing is such, you know, you talk to our sales guys, um, you, you'll find out that our pricing um, it will be uh will be adequate for you. So I think that that's going to be good. Uh, but right. in any case, um, uh, since you are here, I'm sure we will reach out to you because Kim and marketing will make sure that we do because we have <laughs> lots of things that we'll be sending you. So Yeah, that's a good segue. <laughs> so uh, just a reminder, uh, the recording along with some other materials uh, will be emailed out to everyone who registered for the webinar early next week. And I think we are, we are, quite a bit over, so we probably should wrap things up. Um, and there is a, Peter shared that we do have a resource library on our website that you can access. And that includes all of our white papers, videos, tech briefs, data sheets, all kinds of information. The link to that is here, but um, it'll also be in the email that's going out next week. Excellent. All righty. And we'll just awesome. for us to say thank you as well. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. thank you everyone for joining. Thank you.